for this panel, I'd like to bring on Steve, Assad, David, and Raul. And uh, they'll be here having this amazing discussions on the future here with uh, Integrated with RWA. And moderating this chat will be Steve. So without further ado, let's welcome David, Assad, Dave, uh, Steve, and Raul. Awesome. Thank you, Kartik. And thank you, everybody, for um, joining in and sticking with us. Uh, super excited to chat today about um, real-world assets or tokenized assets, depending on your preference. Uh, I've got with, I've got with me a couple of builders in this space, so two of them coming at, at it from slightly different angles. So aside from Centrifuge, maybe coming from a little bit more of a DeFi background mm -hmm. and ha having done some work with Avida in the past, and Dave from Hashnote coming from more of a TradFi uh, perspective. And then we've got um, Raul as well from Chainlink, who helping the guys build, um, laying out the infrastructure to enable more RWA. Chainlink have been building uh, with Aave in DeFi since day one, really. So super excited to work with Chainlink more in the RWA space as that progresses. So before we get stuck into it, I'll just turn it over to the guys to allow them to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about what they're doing in the RWA space. Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I can go first. Um, Good man, Dave. So my name is Dave Shapiro, uh, CTO and co-founder of Hashnote. So we are an on-chain first asset manager. Um, and as it pertains to real world assets or asset backed securities, like we, we've we launched a product in the space that uh, tokenizes short duration yield from uh, short term treasuries. And so, um, yeah, we use that in a number of ways. Uh, looking forward to exploring that. Awesome, man. Nice to meet you all as well. My name is Raul. I work at Chainlink Labs. Um, what I do there is two things. One is I support the Avo ecosystem uh, in whatever way I technically can. So that means uh, you know, aligning roadmaps, making sure we're there where you need us. Uh, and the second thing that I do is I'm the RWA lead. So I uh, basically manage the relationship with tokenized asset issuers and such uh, across uh, Europe and North America. Yeah, awesome. My name's Asad. I uh, do all things DeFi at Centrifuge. You know, most people know Centrifuge as having worked with stablecoins in the past, uh, mainly MakerDAO. We've also done work with Aave in the real-world asset market, and we have a product called Centrifuge Prime, which is all about bringing real-world assets to decentralized organizations. And yeah, super excited for Go. I think one of the big opportunities, and you know, Go's had this kind of since the light paper, uh, real-world assets is always a big potential here. So it's a really exciting topic. Happy to be here. Awesome. So I, I heard at the end of the last panel there, they explained the concept of facilitator. So we don't really need to go into that at this point, which is nice. But I think one of the, the more commonly touted potential facilitators going forward is an RWA facilitator. So it's going to be super interesting to talk about that. But maybe given this is a hackathon and um, given we have an audience of developers, th th this one probably for Dave and Asad, it'd be super interesting to hear about some of the design choices um that you guys considered when when and when yeah when you're building out your products essentially yeah i'm happy to take a stab at it you know we we put out a kind of some thinking and perspective in the ave forums earlier this year before go launched uh kind of sharing what we thought about what you need to do to think about like real world assets and from a stable coins perspective uh, and i'm sure dave will agree the hard part is for developers is that a lot of the work gets done on the legal side and the financial side of it right making decisions about balance sheet space and how do you invest and allocate but i think the biggest opportunity here and i'm sure this is where dave actually agrees as well is that the biggest opportunity is building actually infrastructure to help improve the way these real world assets move around um, especially when you have a decentralized unit of account like go uh, so being able to take data from real world assets and integrate that with the stablecoin and react to that, so you have kind of a programmable balance sheet management, the ability to then take, you know, um, say, uh, assets that don't exist yet today, and you know, in a more digital native form, and integrate them directly with the stablecoin, I think is really exciting. And then ultimately, for all the you know traditional assets, the things that I think are really exciting is clearing and settlement. And how do you improve the facility for how you bring those assets on chain? Um, and to me, that's that's come in some of the design considerations you have to think about and where there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for the space to continue developing, especially with a stable coin like Go. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting question to ask because it's pretty loaded. There's a lot of ways you can take this. Um, I think if we take a step back, the thing that we what triggered us to get into the space was um, there's still like even though we've come up pretty pretty far away in terms of crypto for DeFi, like a lot of primitives don't really exist or they're 
um, let's just say they're not yet in a really mature state. And so when we came to this market um, and we do structured products, uh, mostly like option selling stuff, like the basics of collateral at rest and like what happens in the TradFi market where you're actually, when you post collateral are earning interest. And so um, we went out there and looked for building blocks that we could build on top of. Um, at the time, there wasn't very many token, uh, tokenized treasury products out in the, I think, uh, uh, what was it? The uh, Franklin Templeton was the only one, but like, that's just, you can't really do anything with those tokens. You could just hold them. Uh, and so that wasn't very helpful. And so when we built our, our product, it was really with the intent of like building on top of, um, and I think that the design choices we made were back to what Asada mentioned, like a lot of it is how you structure it legally, because in many cases, the low hanging fruit right now is securities. Um, they're just, it's plain simple securities. Like there's no getting around it. And, um, and you have to have some kind of legal structure. And so when you think about it from like a fund perspective, um, no one's really like it's pretty it's a pretty big misnomer that people are tokenizing treasuries no one's tokenizing treasury they're tokenizing the funds that are then transacting in the treasuries and so when you're looking at it from a technical design space like what what are uh, what is when you buy into a fund what are you receiving and those are shares essentially and like we already have primitives that are really good for representing share ownership and in, in something that's fungible right as long as you're getting at the right price um, uh, relative to people who entered the fund earlier than you did, um, ERC-20s are a pretty like, easy design choice from a technical perspective. Um, but if you were, were going to go down the deep end of actually tokenizing the underlying product, like you'd have to figure out if there is a better specification for that, right? Like if you're looking at 1155s, ERC-1155s, or I think there's even like EIP-3, Two five uh, three two, three five two five, where it like mixes fungibility um, with non fungibility. Like those are kind of the design choices you have to figure out when you're putting together a real world asset. But when it comes to securities, I think you know, Centrifuge is doing a lot of this similar work that we've had to do. Like it's all fungible funds, right, in their shares, and so that's that's how we got to where we are. Yes, yeah, super interesting. Um, Raul as well, did you want to contribute or? Uh... <clears throat> no, I think the the difference is like, what are the design choices that you make as an issuer versus what are the design choices that you make as like a user or a consumer? Uh, because in a way, even like Aave right now, isn't, it isn't so much a user, it's a platform where users come and might interact with their already tokenized assets. Um, and I think for, for, the, for the end user, you're the person that ultimately actually holds the thing or actually puts them in Aave and, and does something with them. Uh, or would do say so once they're accepted. Um, for them, all that matters, but at some point they also just need to interact with something. Like they need to make sure that it's actually backed by something properly, it's actually secure, it's actually protected, uh, that they can actually use it across DeFi. So the the impact of what, for example, Dave and Assad are doing on their side massively impacts what a user, an end user, can actually do on the chain uh, because different legal setups have different implications. Interesting. Yeah, I'll just th throw this one out there as well. So, like, obviously, it's quite a daunting space. Like, more traditional assets, absolutely massive inside size. Do you think? Do you, do you first I try and identify the type of asset you're going to tokenize, or do you first build out the infrastructure and then worry about the asset after? What do you guys think? I, I think it's like a dual-sided marketplace, a little in a way, right? Like. The way we think about stable coins like Go is you have to have balance sheet space to invest in real world assets. And balance sheet space can come from a lot of different things. And you know, ultimately you have to have also this ability to get to fiat. And once you have those considerations, kind of let's say you can do all that, you can then choose to go into you know, let's say your choice of the market. But for a stable coin like Go who wants to be really liquid and usable and kind of a transactional element for traders, probably means like very sticking to liquid and relatively safe assets, right? Then you have to think about building infrastructure. And like Raul said earlier, you know, you can't just say, I'll buy, I'll buy this, you know, this tokenized treasury, you know, whatever it is, and just work with that. You do have to build infrastructure specific to all those legal foundations and whatever the asset is itself. And then having tech on that side is super important. So you have to do both kind of hand in hand. Yeah, I think I think you're spot on. It is a two-sided marketplace. And I think sometimes as developers, we tend to chase shiny objects. 
um, and tokenize something for the sake of tokenizing it. And if you do that, great. But like, what's the use, right? Like we can all, we've all talked about tokenizing real estate, but if you can't use it anywhere, why have we done it, right? If it's not, if the, if like, for example, depositing um, into Aave markets is like, you know, you, you can deposit collateral, right? To then be borrowed out. Like if you tokenize my house, I can't deposit that anywhere, right? I can't use as collateral. One day we may be able to, but as like when you're looking at building out projects, you have to figure out, is there a market for it? And I think that's why you've seen a lot of these tokenized products really start to take off. It's low hanging fruit. Um, it's something that people understand is that they're just getting negative carry by holding stable coins. Um, and there's a need for it, right? Because like the interest rates high, people don't want to have to make a decision between keeping assets off chain versus keeping off assets on chain. And so um, you have that two sided marketplace. Now you have to build out more utility for it to really grow it because let's be honest, like RWAs is still really, really, really small. <laughs> like as a market, like we talk about it, everyone hypes it up, but it is a really small market still. And so um, if we start talking about real estate and all this other crazy stuff that sounds cool, might not be really useful for another 10 years. Um, we still have a lot of work to do to build out just even this easy stuff and and, and build out that infrastructure to take it in and do something with it. And also like debunk a lot of the um, unknowns in the space, right? People think that, you know, by holding uh, a security, you're somehow in, um, your a regulator is gonna come after you. Like holding securities, there's doesn't make you like turn you into a regulated entity, right? That holding a, a security as an asset uh, or as collateral there's nothing that says that you will then have, you know, the SEC will come after you, but it's those kinds of information that has to be put out there so that the whole space grows. And that's, I think it, aside, you're absolutely right. It's a two-sided marketplace and you need to have the users, uh, the people who want the thing you're tokenizing. Otherwise, why are we doing it? We're just taking a block space. Yeah, yeah, I fully agreed. I think it's also important there to delineate between, um, why you're tokenizing and what you're tokenizing. Like the whole crypto space is like what, one or $2 trillion in, in, uh, in total market cap. If you look outside of you know the blockchain, it's like $95 trillion or even more than that, like in, in the hundreds of, of trillions of dollars. Um, when that comes on chain, as for example, a lot of strategy consultants are saying, um, they're, gonna be, they're gonna be on Ethereum. A lot of this is gonna be on like private chains. So that's gonna be like banks in between themselves tokenizing their deposits or tokenizing shares and settling on a blockchain type system. That might even be like a private L2 or something like uh, like Polygon's Nightfall, but that's probably not gonna be on Ethereum. And when you start, for example, met, um, putting a lot of um, houses on chain, for example, like a lot of real estate, when a government starts doing that, they're probably not gonna do it on Ethereum. And you're probably, at least not in the beginning, gonna be able to put it into like DeFi or something. So in that case, you're not tokenizing something for me or for you or for anybody else. You're tokenizing it to gain, for example, settlement benefits or like you know, slight uh, efficiencies here and there. And that's a very different use case. Uh, and we're going to see both types of tokenization happening at the same time. But I think the, to me, the most interesting piece of tokenization and definitely the most interesting piece for Aave is where you really need that demand side. You need people to say, I want to be able to have this particular asset from the real world in the blockchain to do something useful with it. Cool. Uh, super interesting insights. Uh, so thinking more specifically to Go, so Go obviously at the minute is purely crypto backed. Like, What do you think are some of the advantages to diversifying the collateral base to RWA? Yeah, we've, we've seen, I think, in the market now, the way that other crypto native stable coins have kind of integrated with real world asset markets, right? There's obviously MakerDAO is a big standout and a big opportunity for them was to just take stable coins that are on the balance sheet and earn yield on that, right? But two, I think that what that really did was actually, you know, give a lot of significant revenue in a time when the market was down. So diversification is a huge benefit. And I think that's maybe like the first and primary benefit real world assets give compared to crypto native assets. 
but I also think it kind of provided an element of stability to DAI and the stable coin itself, right? Uh, and, you know, when you have safe and liquid collateral on the balance sheet, and ultimately, you know, U.S. Treasury bill is harder to find safer and more liquid collateral than that, you do get this element of, you know, being able to smooth out volatility and reduce kind of some risky nature of what's, you know, backing your stable coin, which I think is a huge element of it, right? But there's, there's a ton of, uh, you know, design opportunities to start, like, extending into, you know, Call it riskier collaterals, but still safe and still liquid. Um, you know, you can see the things that Frax has been doing, for example. Uh, you can look at other places in the ecosystem, which are creating kind of like synthetic lending on top of real world assets, or even other uh, stable coins that are just, you know, passing back yield in different ways and kind of providing like intermediation opportunities for their users. These are, that's what I think is like really exciting about real world assets. Ultimately, it's a huge market that's diversified and you can kind of make of it what you will, depending on like Raul said, what your users are interested in and what they want to want, want to see from your stable coin. Yeah, I think for for Go specifically, it's it's definitely an opportunity. I know that, you know, at certain times, you know, you look at what what are the options for Go? Like where do they put their stable coins? Do they put it into the markets and start earning like pretty high interest rates? Um, I think it's a different diversification question, but it's also like Asad, to your point, treasuries are liquid, but it also depends on how you structure your real world asset and if those things are actually liquid or and like how much of uh, the the underlying instruments you're buying and what is the duration risk and do you have do you have the ability to actually get out of those positions in the event that you need to liquidate right and when you're a decentralized stable coin using crypto um, you can get a bank run right and how do you how are you actually able to liquidate those positions and i think that's really important with any um with any crypto native stable coin is looking at uh investing in real world assets because you are essentially taking it off chain and how quickly you can get those stable coins back on chain is is critical um because you know like what happens if there is a bank run nothing's there's no like gatekeep players there's no safety mechanisms uh, currently in place if everyone just at the same time decides to pull their money. And most of these products are at best, um, you know, T T1. Uh, we, depending on how, depending on when we find out, we can honor T0 uh, redemptions, but that's like, that's pretty unique to ours. Uh, most others are T2 and like, and when you have a bank run, that's, that's a problem. Even with us, we're not instant, right? Yeah, interesting. And talking about the, um, so like the liquidation piece. So like, obviously, I mean, obviously that's a vital part of Abbey in general, doing anything with Abbey, you need the ability to liquidate collateral types. So essentially what you're saying is we need more liquidity on secondary markets. So that that does seem like one of the real challenges. What what do you guys think are one of the catalysts to make that happen? It, I think it's happening slowly, right? You know, there's uh, so many different pieces that are being brought on chain. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, Raul, which which part of the on chain ecosystem you're talking about is really relevant here. But there are many different people coming. You know, the more tokenized treasury bill providers you have that's like one aspect of it they don't have more interested customers i think ultimately what you need is like really like the marketplaces to trade and exchange those assets it's really hard to do it on existing DeFi rails today not even just from a compliance and kind of permissions perspective but also just not every kind of dex is actually well equipped to trade u.s treasury bills right it's kind of like trading stable coins and kind of different like fixed income trading is a is a kind of unique beast that i don't think we've seen amms really solve very well that's that's one aspect that i'll say i'll, I'll curious to hear what our Raul and dave have to say yeah i think in general what we've seen with a lot of rwas is when they come on chain the volume is quite low uh, especially when compared to, for example, market cap and such. And I think that's a bit the nature of the asset. Like you don't want a crypto asset. You specifically want something that's off chain, that exists off chain. And generally all the liquidity for that certainly is off chain. So there is an argument to be made that obviously we want like liquidity on the secondary markets. But if you think about it, the actual liquidity on the secondary markets is there. Like it's out of the blockchain. It's like on the actual uh, securities exchanges, for example. Mm. So. There's an argument to be made that rather than requiring a lot of liquidity in, for example, like a curve or a Uniswap, um, you can instead basically have a guarantee that yes, indeed, you can swap this thing for the same thing in the real world and then be able to sell it there. 
um, if you look at other, like uh, as, as, as Dave actually very well mentioned, is that um, you're not actually owning T-bills. You're owning basically a wrapper around T-bills. It's, uh, in a way, it's a little bit similar to an ETF where you put a wrapper around the actual asset. And ETFs also have massive requirements around market makers to be able to take your ETF, unwrap it, sell it, and then give you back the money and the other way around. And that basically keeps ETFs pretty much on par. And something like that on the blockchain would work basically just as well and allow you to tap into the liquidity off-chain. Interesting. Yeah, yeah sorry, Dave, go on. <clears throat> no, I was gonna I was gonna reiterate that. I think that getting more participation from different venues, um, different uh, OTC desks. Like at the end of the day, I think that there's also a cultural shift that needs to happen with at least the stuff that's taking off. These are securities, requires KYC, like the DGENs and like people who are in the space aren't exactly super excited about that. But I think it's just a natural progression of, of where things are going as things mature. Um, there is a need to become a little bit more open about who you are and not, and if you want to be, you know, completely pseudo anonymous out there, like it's not, it's, these are just not the right products for you. Um, but as like DAOs get more serious and get more, um, you know, get more serious about wanting to create sustainability, this is a natural way of achieving some of that. Um, but again, it's just the market needs to get, um, get comfortable around it and then getting KYC and then getting permission because these tokens, um, unless there's um, a permissioned one, permissionless one uh, that really, you know, truly becomes easy to to transact in, um, it's gonna be pretty hard uh, for the And Raul, you, you raise a good point there about this, the um, liquidity living, like there is liquidity on secondary markets, it's just not on chain. Like, do, do you think it matters whether um, collateral types for Go live on or off chain? And like, if the collateral types are off chain primarily, do you think token holders currently have enough recourse if something was to go wrong? And just open that up to everybody, of course. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's it, it's hard to make a sweeping statement there because this depends entirely on the project, on the asset being tokenized, how their structure is, and, and all these things. I mean. Um, like, can you redeem whenever you need to? And how can you redeem whenever you need to? Like, you need to be KYC, prob probably. Uh, can you rely on market participants and all these kinds of things? I mean, like, the benefit of having crypto is it exists on the blockchain, and you know for sure that it's good. Like, they're good for the money because, you know, you can actually audit the code of, you know, Ethereum itself. You know, that it's not going to be uh, a massive exploit, for example, hopefully. Um, well, with an RWA, inherently the issuer is allowed to mint more of the asset for example and also is allowed to basically usually uh stop redemptions whenever they want to or when there's no liquidity or when they're like t plus two time and they, they just need more days to give you the money for example um and in those cases in those times it's critical for for example the Ave DAO to know that even though they might have to wait a little longer the money is actually there and they're good for the money and that's gonna take one part just a lot of like risk analysis. Like Yave Dao, I think is actually very good in this and has shown that they have a really good team on this to make sure that yes, you know, legally everything is correct and you know everything is set up properly off chain. And then secondarily, I would say you need to know that the tokens that you hold are actually backed by something off chain. And that's where something where, for example, the proof of reserve can help. And that way you can attest to the assets actually living and being held in the off chain place. And making sure that uh, the issuer can't actually like massively start minting without having proper backing. Yeah, I, I, so, sorry, just building on that rule. Like, I think there's a big opportunity for like developers, right, to to hackathon talking about Go to really take advantage of the data you get when real world assets are brought on chain. You know, and really what I mean by that is you have structures that are being brought on chain. You have tokenization kind of of assets, and yes, there's data off chain, but there's also a real big opportunity to integrate that data on chain. And make it usable for Go. And I think that's actually where you'll find the biggest edge. And that's like really the biggest untapped opportunity for stable coins today is yes, they're allocating to real assets, but integrating them into how that you know, 
the stable coin actually operates and its balance sheet mechanics is, the, is a huge opportunity. And if you can do that in an automated fashion, I mean, that's where I think the, the ceiling is unlimited for Go and its ability to allocate to real-world assets and use it effectively as part of just growing and supporting the ecosystem. And then you think about integrating other things on top of it, like trading venues or supporting other kind of liquidity mechanisms, even custom to Go on-chain for real-world assets. That's where I think it gets really exciting. Yeah, I think you brought up a really interesting point, Raul. There's like, there is the off-chain piece of it. How do you va verify that you have it? I think, and I think you guys have a pretty good product in the market for something like that. I think the problem um, that most projects need to grapple with is the incentives, right? Like your product isn't free and who's paying for it, right? Um, and we're, and you guys are aligned as a, as a service provider to somebody you, um, are in, you know, you're incentivized to uh, make the person that's paying you, you know, feel like they're getting the value. Whereas I think in this space, that's kind of contradictory. You really want to have an adversarial um, party that will um, ensure that the value of what you're saying is actually there because it's not in their best interest um, to, they're not incentivized to like, not have that happen, right? So um, I think that's the that's a that's something to really think through when you're putting together a project. Is hiring Chainlink to do the off-chain reserves is interesting, but from an incentives perspective, it's a little bit weird, right? To think about it's like what happened with uh, what is it the auditor and, um, audit like audit firms when a company hires an audit firm to audit themselves, it's like, okay, but they're working for you and they're gonna make the numbers do what you want them to do. But if you had uh, another party that came in to audit you, the incentives are to, to make sure that everything's super clean. And so I think it's, as the space matures, like we'll see more of that, um, but it's interesting to think through. Yeah, I think you kind of answer, like, like you kind of give the answer in your, your, your message there, which is, uh, you can obviously have the protocol itself or the project itself saying, hey, we want to basically attest to this. Uh, you can also have the Aave DAO saying, we will only accept RWAs that are tested according to a particular standard, for example. Uh, and in that case, you know, that is a possibility where, for example, the Aave DAO pays for it and the actual client of the attestation would not be, you know, whoever's paying us, but rather the Aave DAO, for example. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Cool. I didn't even know I was laying you up to talk about proof of reserve there, Raul, but uh, nice <laughs> job. <laughs> you. Uh, Dave, you touched on um, the minting redemption side there. Would be super interested to hear um, um, just a quick run through as to how that process works. Same same story with you, Asad. Like, I think just super interesting to hear what goes on uh, in the sausage factory, essentially. Yeah happy to talk through it. Um, so I guess it, it really depends on how you structure your product and what your token actually represents, right? So uh, typically when a client comes, when our investor client comes to us, and this is already someone who's KYC, they've already been whitelisted, they're, they're able to hold um, the token that represents share ownership in this fund. Um, they can deposit through fiat rails or they can go through crypto rails and, you know, crypto, uh, collateral that we take it is um, in the form of USDC, um, Pi USD, and, and a few others. Um, but then also, you know, investors still use wires and fiat. And so that's also a way of doing it. If you're doing things on chain, there is there's transactions you can make with with our protocol that will basically buy into the fund at the current share price. And so the share price gets updated on a daily basis based on the activities of the fund. And so you can transact and, and have an atomic basically swap where you deposit a stable coin and receive um, a token representing the assets um, of the fund, uh, basically at, struck at the nav of that day. And then same on the redemptions, depending on um, what form you're taking, if you're taking it in kind, or if you're looking for um, um, to receive, you know, you pay, you subscribe to the table, but you know, you're you want to take it out in USD. USD, um, that's something that can be arranged. So it just depends on how it works. But on chain, again, uh, in a lot of these things, there is liquidity. Like there's not a ton of liquidity on chain usually for these things. 
Um, if there is, then you can just automatically um, redeem. Uh, but if not, then you know there's a process for liquidating the assets off chain, uh, converting that to crypto, putting it in a position where you can then you know burn the shares that you have and in turn receive um, the, the, your your investment back. Um, and so it's it it all depends. And as you build out a project, you have to keep in mind like who is your target client? Like, are they going to be comfortable with sending you wires or are they going to do it all on chain? And depending on that, you're going to have to have certain processes in place to start sending money to bank accounts. What happens on liquidations? You know, these are, um, these things exist in different places, right? It's not like uh, hash notes fund is just sitting in a bank account, right? There's prime brokerages, there's custodians involved. There's a whole like TradFi infrastructure that's that's sitting behind what this token represents. And when you're, whenever you're jumping chains, right? TradFi in a way is a chain, just not one that's public. Um, you, it takes a little bit of time. And so uh, that's- So, so how, how quickly can I go from having go in my wallet to um, then minting your treasury token and, and, and then back? Because yeah. of course you support so, gold. Uh, if during market hours, <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, because we are, we are a, a TradFi product, there's, there's wires involved here. And so during market hours, usually on Fed wire schedules, you can get in um, most of the day. And then anything getting out uh, in small size is within, um, you can do it on chain immediately for, I think, up to like a million dollars. Um, anything above that can be T0 if we find out early enough in the day. Again, it kind of depends on wire schedules. If we can't get a wire out from bank accounts, uh, from prime brokerages to bank accounts um, in time, then uh, it'll have the VT one. But if we find out early, it's T zero. And then, I, and then I think the important piece to figure out is how you're actually implementing it on the back end, right? Like, how much how much liquidity do you have? Are you actually buying long term treasuries? Like those those things are. Do you have duration? So you may not be liquid on some of those things. So it, it's it depends. Like in our in our case, we. We are, you can redeem within T1 up to the full amount for every, everyone can come to us uh, during the day and say they want out. And the next day, everybody can get out. But it all depends on how you structure your, your product and not all products can live up to that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to add to us to answer like that really thorough, right? And ultimately, at the end of the day, a lot of these things are going to look similar kind of at the conceptual level. And then today's point, the differences are in just like the operational nature of how the fund manager and, you know, the fund is set up and things like that. So, so maybe I'll share like kind of two, uh, a couple different things here. Like on the Centrifuge side, you know, we have Centrifuge Prime, which has its own legal infrastructure. And what we do there is we set up kind of an ability for a DAO or a decentralized organization to have kind of a, a tool that it can use to KYC with certain investments. And then you can have the investments and redemptions triggered kind of on chain in an automated fashion. Um, and then I think one of the opportunities, again, you know, for builders and just talking again about like really where I think there's some interesting, like really also demand there, right? Is actually building kind of better, like call it web two and a half rails. So as Dave's point, you know, you're dealing with bank wires, you're dealing with kind of traditional banking payment systems to do half the transaction, then the other half of the transaction is obviously on chain, right? Usually going through like a fiat stablecoin and then into kind of the stablecoin of choice for let's say users. I think there's a lot to be built that kind of connects those two systems better together. Now, you know, building payment rails is obviously a, a huge uh, daunting process and it's big, but like there's a lot of people in the space, fintech startups. I mean, you know, you can imagine even Plaid has a role to kind of play here if you can build integrations with it appropriately. And like that, that type of stuff, I think really does meaningfully move the needle for how you can improve the way these things are done. There will always be some operational limitations, but you can improve the way you manage those limitations and like have visibility into them and risk manage them and things like that as well. Uh, and then the uh, maybe the final statement too is I like, we talk about liquidity, right? For a stable coin, there, there's always going to be a buffer that needs to be kept. And this is like really the work for like, like the facilitator, the way I believe it's structured and set up to manage is keeping some part of the stable coin and on-chain stable representations and then managing the off-chain representations and kind of appropriately ensuring liquidity buffers so that you can, you know, fulfill redemptions on chain and then go into your off-chain holdings, uh, you know, when you need to as well, only at, like, you know, after that buffer has been eaten through. And those type of things, I think, go a long way. So it's like, you know, operational on the back end, 
that's kind of all the operational wiring that happens between the two kind of worlds. And then there's also all the operational stuff that's done on chain. And that's what sets up, up you know, facilitators apart ultimately is where there's a large part of design opportunities too. Steve, to go back to your first question. Mm. Cool. And um, just quickly, Raul, wanted to give you bring you back in from the sidelines super quick, just to give you the opportunity to talk kind of more broadly about the data and interoperability side of things in RWA. And then um, we will need to wrap things up. I'll maybe um, uh, do one quick um, fire question after that. But Raul, just quick question on the data and interoperability side. <clears throat> Sorry, is, is there a question still coming, or just how, how did that interact with the uh, the actual tokenized assets? Because yeah, my can... bad. So to, to, to be super clear, <laughs> so just talking about talking more broadly about the role of data and interoperability in RWA. Like I know you, I'm, I know you've already touched on proof of reserve, so don't necessarily need to get into how Chainlink's um, building out underlying infrastructure to enable Go facilitators, because I think that plays into things. But um, just broadly on on the data yeah. and interoperability side. <clears throat> Yeah, that makes a, that makes sense. I think um, as, as as they very well noticed, like you're you're bringing something on the chain, and it's basically a wrapped version of whatever exists off chain. And if you really think about it, it's just a super plain vanilla ERC twenty uh, with added trust assumptions. So what are you really going to use this thing for? Like, it's an ERC twenty, but it, but now somebody has the keys to be able to mint something, and that's a feature, not a bug. Um, so how do you ensure that it's safe? How do you ensure that you can actually use it somewhere? How do you can 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 know that what is the actual price of the underlying assets? What is the actual price of the assets on the secondary market? Um, because you know, on the, on the secondary market on chain, usually the volume is pretty low. So how do you know what the actual price of the is? You need to be able to use it in DeFi. You need to be able to have price feeds. You need to be able to bring it across chains and use it in all, all across the ecosystem. Um, if you're just issuing a tokenized asset and you're not bringing it with it basically all the plugins that you need, uh, then what you're doing is effectively just capturing possibly the slight benefits of like faster settlement and all these things, which for a tokenized asset on a public chain is, is, is basically not there because you're not actually moving the security, you're moving a wrapped version of the security. So if you want this thing to be useful on permissionless blockchains, you need to bring an ecosystem of data. You need to tell us what is this thing, what is the price, where is it held, what are these people doing, how can I bring it across chain, uh, and all, all these kinds of features, because otherwise, and that's just a plain vanilla year 20. Cool. That's super insightful. Um, we will have to finish up um, now, but just maybe quickly, uh, quick fire going around the room. A any other words of advice for aspiring RWA builders? And then you can potentially um, um, give us an answer as to what an ideal split looks like between RWA and crypto based collateral as it relates to Go. <laughs> <clears throat> Dave, you kicked us off, so why don't you start again, and um, we'll, we'll we'll let everybody um, um, get home or finish up their weeks. <laughs> oh, you're uh, muted, Dave. Um, sorry about that. I talked about this in the past. I think that the thing that we have a really good opportunity to do is to come at it from a very like come at the space from really a considered legal structure right i think that a lot of times as a founder and i'm guilty of this myself is you want to build quickly and get to market quickly and so you cut corners um i think when you start doing that you build up a lot of legal uh, and regulatory debt that's very hard to pay back and so coming at this we have an opportunity to really I mean, the whole goal is to create a better financial environment, um, financial ecosystem. And so figuring out the structure that your RWA should take is really, really important. And don't skimp on that because it will really hurt you in the end. And I think that it really comes to light when we get blow ups, right? And like we're in the space and blow ups happen every more frequently than most. But like it's not not so different from TradFi either, right? Like you just don't hear about those as much. Um, and so the, the legal structure that you take is really important and try and make it as, as friendly to the holders of your, um, whatever you're issuing as you can, right. In the event that things blow up, don't, 
don't have a legal structure that makes it very murky as to what it is that your uh, your shareholders are actually able to get to their assets with, right? Like if you're a wrapper of a wrapper of a wrapper, like this is a problem. It's not really clear what's going to happen when things blow up. And I think that uh, moving quickly you leads to situations where um, when things blow up, people lose money. And so I think as we start to bridge TradFi, you know, chain and and uh, block, uh, public blockchains, like let's be extra careful about how we do it. It's it's not time that you're going to be upset you spent. Um, otherwise, I don't know what the right answer to your second the second part of your question is. I think it just depends on each DAO and like for Ave how you balance like what is the outcome that you're trying to achieve? Um, I think it, 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 there is a role to play, but I don't think that there is a, uh, you know, a straight up answer that uh, makes sense. And it, and it might be a floating one, right? As time goes on, like that number changes from, you know, being high or being low to being the opposite. And so I don't think there is the right answer. It's just understanding what the current state is and adjusting to it and having the, you know, mechanisms in place to quickly adjust in um you know when markets markets change which they inevitably do awesome Asad? yeah um so answer your first question uh like i think things to consider is you know maybe picking up on what Ra- raul said one of like the ethos of centrifuge is trying to bring as much on chain as possible about like the fund structure about the assets about the portfolio type and uh, we're trying to serve as a platform for people to build on top of. So if you're looking to build an art and make space, my plea to you is to come to Centrifuge and build with us. And, you know, let's bring an ecosystem of data to our partners. And we hope Ave will be a partner one day on Go. Uh, and then for your last question, maybe like, you know, yeah, it, yeah look, Dave's right. But uh, maybe my, the fun answer is I think it should be at least as big as your crypto native allocation. Right. Uh, you know, there's always room for real assets. There's always room for a slice of pizza. There's always room for real assets. It's a new thing. Nice, nice. I'll, uh, I'll split the difference on this one. Um, I think you need you need to build a, a sandbox for developers that's both safe and fun. Like there needs to be enough features to the actual token, enough data that you can do something useful with it. But the core needs to be super secure and safe. Like you need to have your shit in order and you need to have, make sure that you can do something useful with it because as a developer, you just want to take the token and do stuff. You don't want to think about all the stuff. You don't want to do you know five, five weeks of due diligence that you have no idea how it works. Just take the token, run with it, use it as collateral, you do whatever you like. Uh, I think that, that, that's kind of the key. And in terms of the split, I I think it's way too early to answer that, to be honest. Um, honestly, the amount of stable coins that we see is very limited compared to the amount of stable coins that I think we're going to see. And a stable coin, in a way, is very similar to like a bank deposit. And if you look at, like I don't know, the 10,000 TradFi banks that exist, they're backed by completely different types of collateral. Like if I if I take my money to one bank versus another versus another, they're going to invest it in any very different ways. So I think we're going to see a lot of different, uh, let's say a thousand flowers bloom in that way. I'm sure you were um, messaging me 100% in the chat there, Raul. <laughs> Maybe. Um, awesome. Well, look, thanks so much, guys. I hope that's been useful. Um, if anybody has any other questions, please let us know. Otherwise, good luck to everybody participating in the hackathon, and thanks a lot. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Steve. And thanks for moderating, Steve. That was an amazing discussion.